Imagine you are at the, check at the checkout at the supermarket and you take your cash card, you got something like 35 euros to pay, and you place it just on the top of the terminal, it makes a beep, and you have paid. Well, how does near-field communication work? Uh, in particular, what happens at the protocol levels? Well, the answers are given now by Simon Oemes, who is a co-founder of Payworks. It's a company uh, specialized in point-of-sale payment gateway technologies. Simon um, has studied informatics in Munich, in San Francisco, and in Los Angeles. So let's welcome now Simon with his talk on decoding contactless card payments. Simon, yours. Well, thanks a lot. And yeah, what a crowd. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining tonight. Um, and tonight I want to talk about contactless card payments and how we go from like inserting a card to tapping a card to in the end just tapping your smartphone. And full disclosure, I'm not talking about like exposing new security risks in that format and also I'm not going on the lowest level of the EMV protocol which is basically below the, uh, the, um, running this. But um, I rather want to focus on the status quo. Um, how is basically a contactless card transaction working? Um, how do we do um, Apple Pay? How do we do Android Pay? What is involved there? And why is it now possible to actually take a card and clone it to your smartphone? Something that the chip card should actually prevent you from, from doing. Um, and just to give you some context where this is coming from, um, I work at Payworks where we run a payment gateway and develop tools for making transactions uh, easier for um, developers to integrate. Um, and over there, I'm mainly responsible for integrating new terminals, connecting new banks. And I want to take the motto of the uh, Congress, uh, two watt, and just two watt, and give you some insights in what I learned while, while working on that. Um, and um, yeah, let's get started with this. Um, Probably everybody here in the room has heard about contactless payments and has used it. Maybe, maybe not. Um, I mean, in Germany, adoption rate for contactless transactions are relatively slow. First of all, you get a new uh, card from your bank or your credit card company, uh, and even if you have that, you still need a terminal which is actually able to handle contactless transactions. And if you then finally do a contactless transaction, uh, the cashier is looking at you very curiously and saying, well, this is not happen that, that's not how it worked basically before. Um, and in the end, you get your goods, but there are always some surprises uh, waiting for you. And what we are looking at uh, tonight is basically, first of all, what makes a contactless transaction. Um, the blueprint, what stages do we go through? Um, then we need to discuss ways of actually converting your smartphone into um, emulating or simulating a contactless card. Um, in addition to that, I want to talk a little bit about making payments a little bit more secure at the, at the point of sale or uh, on the e-commerce side in general, um, where we talk about tokenization. And then we have all the information that we need to actually um, look into Apple Pay and Android Pay. And in the end, I just want to give a, a quick look out on how I could envision uh, the next steps when it comes to contactless transactions and transactions uh, at the point of sale in general. So, looking at contactless transactions, um, this is a relatively new technology, and you might think, well, somebody came up with something new uh, that was basically state of the art. But if you look at the underlying protocols, you will see that this just brings EMV transactions, that's uh, the protocol or the, um, um, the workflows that are used for, contactless, uh, for the traditional chip cards to the contactless level. So, you basically take what you have and put basically NFC on it, and, and that's it. And because um, I'm not going into too much detail when it comes to the contactless transaction.
um, where he was talking about EMV transactions and is actually going on the lowest level, looking at the specs, looking at the protocols, and what actually makes a, a transaction work in the end, what data elements are, are involved in there. But for us, um, it's important to first have a look what is actually or who is actually involved in, a, in an overall transaction. And this is not only true for a contactless transaction, also a contact transaction using a chip card is, is basically using the same entities. So on the one hand, you have yourself as a shopper, as somebody who wants to buy something, and you have a credit card. Um, and this credit card is given to you by a bank, by your bank, and because this bank issues you the card, this bank is called an issuer. And then on the other side, you have a merchant uh, who owns a store, um, and he wants to accept credit card payments. So he needs a terminal. But just owning a terminal, terminal doesn't give him anything. He needs to have a, a merchant account with an, a separate bank, where, in the end, the money is basically put onto. Um, and this is called an acquiring bank or acquirer. So now we have two sides, and basically they itself uh, look fine, but um, in, in some way we need to bring those two together. Um, and, well, we know what we use. We use a network, um, and in our case we use payment networks. Um, this would be, for example, the Visa network, the MasterCard network, American Express network, the networks that are available, and they interconnect the acquirers and the issuers so that in the end um, the payment can be transacted basically between all parties. Now that we know who basically is involved in a transaction, let's have a look the, of the different phases or steps you go through during a transaction. Before you can actually make a transaction, well, you need your card. So this is a card issuing step, and um, the merchant needs his terminal. So this is the terminal provisioning, where he gets a terminal, it's configured, gets the correct uh, configurations loaded there and, and set up, and configured what kind of cards should be accepted. And then we're at this point where we actually want to make a transaction. Um, and there you basically go through three distinct phases. So you have the, the, the phase where you basically tap your card to the, to the terminal. Then you have a phase where the terminal is doing some internal stuff, um, evaluating what the data that it actually received. And um, most likely after that, it will go in a phase where it basically goes online, uses the network, talk to the issuer of your card um, to check if you actually have funds on your uh, account and if this transaction is genuine and should be um, actually approved. And after that, we have a, a, a separate phase, which is not that important for us, um, which is uh, the transaction settlement. So this, in the end, makes sure that actually money moves from one account to the other. Um, we're going to basically focus on the, on the three highlighted here. Um, so imagine you go um, into a store and want to pay with your card. Uh, the first thing is that uh, on the terminal, um, the amount is basically shown, and you, as a shopper, go there and tap your card on, on the terminal. And uh, the terminal in this phase basically sees, okay, well, I have a contactless card uh, in my proximity, and I have a basic idea uh, what kind of card is this. So is this a Visa card, is this a MasterCard, um, is this an Amex card, JCB, you name it. And as a first thing, before actually continuing with the transaction, um, it activates a special kernel. And what a kernel is, is a, an implementation of a, of a payment workflow that is specified by the schemes. So Visa mandates a different workflow, how the card and terminal should interact as part of a contactless transaction and then MasterCard, for example. All this was easier um, during a normal chip transaction because there was only one kernel. Now we have seven or eight kernels and each payment scheme has its own kernel. And after the correct kernel has been loaded and activated, the kernel now drives the transactions between um, the card and the terminal. And the next phase is then the, the data exchange phase, where the terminal asks the card for some data to be, be given out in order to complete a transaction. And what this normally includes is, first of all, the account data. That's the credit card number, expiry date information like that, which is like, crucial for actually routing the transaction to the correct bank and um, making the, the transaction work in the end. Um, you get um, um, a signature um, on specific data elements that the card generates um, and which allows the terminal to check if the card is an actual payment card. And um, the card also generates a cryptogram um, that's uh, in the end a cryptographic hash uh, that allows the issuer in the end to uh, verify that the transaction is genuine and that it's a, like a recent transaction, not a replay, for example. 
And all of this basically just happens between the card and the terminal at this point. After that, you can remove your card, and that's also one of the big differences already. Um, if you would do a contact transaction with a chip, the chip card needs to be in, in the terminal until the com complete transaction is, is done. Uh, here, you can already remove it, and you don't accidentally wiggle with it and trigger an abort. So this actually uh, provides some more uh, usability features uh, also. Next phase we're looking at is then what's happening on the terminal. And at this point, only the terminal is doing something. Um, and first of all, it checks if this card should be accepted at this location. Um, could be that the card should only be used domestically in, in, a, in, a, in a country, but it's not the country of, of the merchant. It uh, could be that this card is an ATM card and shouldn't be used at a retail location, for example. Um, and, and those things are basically checked first. As a second step, um, the, the, the terminal is verifying the authenticity of the the data it received from the card. And for that, there is a, a public key infrastructure in place. At the top, there is a root CA from, from the payment schemes. And below that, uh, we have uh, um, a CA um, from the actual issuer of the card. And then we have certificates which were put on the card itself. And um, as, as a, basically, as reading data, it got this, this kind of uh, um, signed data. And using public key infrastructure, the terminal can actually check if the signature that was created by the private key on the card uh, was provided or created by an entity which at some point was signed by the, by the root CA. And then, as a last step, there is this phase of a customer verification. You probably all know this. You go in a supermarket, pay for um, a couple of things, and in the end, you're asked for a signature or a PIN. Um, new with contactless transaction is that if you're below a certain limit, you're not asked for anything. Um, but nevertheless, you are going through this phase. And most likely, especially with contactless transactions, at the end, um, the terminal decides, well, I should go online and check if this uh, account is actually um, valid, has the funds that uh, I want to get from it. And then the terminal starts like a chain of, of transactions or of, of, of hops. And the terminal sends the data, including the account data and this uh, cryptogram, to the actual acquiring bank. And from there, the acquiring bank sends it to the global payment network. And based on the first digits of the, your credit card, the payment networks know what the actual issuer is, because every issuer has assigned a specific number a range. And then in the end, the issuer receives this kind of data, sees the cryptogram, and basically is able to verify that this is an, a genuine transaction made with the card that it uh, says it is, and uh, checks if the funds are available, and then hopefully approves the transactions in the end. And then this OK basically goes from, from the lowest end back to the terminal. Um, it shows approved, and in the end, you get your goods um, and can leave. So that's basically looking at, uh, at a whole transaction as, a, as, a, as an entity. Um, talk a little bit about what kind of data is exchanged as, as that. I think it's uh, interesting to see what actually is basically saved on the credit card. Um, again, um, Tim's talk about EMV has some more detailed information on that. But what you basically get is account information. You get your um, primary account number, your credit card number, basically. You get your track two equivalent data. That's basically a data element which mimics the data that would normally be on a Mac stripe if you still had one. Um, there are still networks which only route those kind of information and not the whole transaction data. Um, and for backward compatibility and legacy reasons, this is still present. Aside from that, you also, for example, have the expiry date. Um, then you have verification information. So what kind of verification should be supported? Uh, the card can make some recommendations. The terminal has some information what it actually supports. Does it have a pin pad? Does it doesn't have a pin pad? Should we accept signatures? Information like that. Then we have the authentication data. Um, there you basically get the, uh, the reference to your um, CA uh, public key from, uh, from the card schemes. Um, you get the public key of the card itself um, and the resulting signed data to check offline on the terminal if the transaction is, is valid. And then you have the authorization data, um, which is, I mean, Aside from the card information, the amount and currency, which is crucial. I mean, in the end, you want to get basically a specific amount um, during the transaction. And then you add the date and time, um, the cryptogram, which allows the, uh, the issuer to verify that this transaction is genuine. And basically, that's 
basically the information that's used during a transaction. Um, the um, format or the protocol that is used for the uh, communication between the card and the terminal is uh, ISO 7816. Um, that's basically what's normally talked between um, a card reader, any card reader and a chip card. And the payload is BER, TLV encoded. It's like a self-encoding format um, which allows you to add more or less data as part of your communication. And we will talk about the communication then between the terminal and the acquirer or the entities be behind that. Um, you have uh, mostly an ISO variant of uh, ISO 8583, um, especially with the acquirers, but also banking networks um, use this. And that's a bitmap based uh, format, um, which has uh, very weird bitmap combinations and is a, is a pain to, uh, to debug if you, if you want to send a valid message there. Um, yeah, so comparing NFC to ICC, why should I use it? What's the benefit? Uh, why actually go for it? Um, so normally you have a lot faster transaction times. Now there are timing limits on how, f how fast a card and a terminal need to interact in this first interaction phase. Um, and you can also remove the card already after this phase and this is normally completed within a second. Um, you also get some benefits when it comes to verification, minutes, uh, verification me methods and limits. Um, so they introduced or rediscovered um, something which is uh, a no CVM. So this means you don't have to provide a signature or a PIN. Um, and they introduced a limit un under which you don't have to basically provide anything. Um, in the end, this was probably added to ease or to incentivize you as a shopper to use contactless transactions. But then again, we also have legacy, and this means that NFC transactions run in two operating modes, EMV mode, which is basically upgrading ICC transaction to contactless, and then we have MaxTrap mode. Um, for those networks back then in the US, but also in other uh, countries uh, around the world, which only can route MaxTrap information and not EMV or ICC information. And there, this relies heavily on just using track 2 equivalent data. So now we have seen how a context transaction is made, what steps we go through, what is required as part of, of data elements for actually making a transaction. Now we want to talk about how can we actually make a smartphone simulate or emulate such card. Um, and not everybody should be able to just do it and say, well, I want to have my card on my phone, and that's it. Um, and there are two distinctive ways on, on how you can do this. And the first one is, is basically using a, something which is called a, a secure element, which is a, an enclave for cryptographic and sensitive information, um, which basically, once it basically receives this kind of information, no longer gives it out. It's basically a micro HSM, if you like. And your normal chip card is basically a secure element, um, but nowadays um, we also have phones which include this. So also again, looking at the parties, if you talk about secure elements and basically providing this information required for making a transaction to a secure element, what do we need there? Uh, well, on the one hand we need the smartphone, uh, or in this case we are talking predominantly about a smartphone, which has this kind of secure element and which at some point receives the information and data required for emulating a card. And then we have something which is called a trusted service manager. This exists for a long time and this is also uh, the entity which normally provisions your actual ship card and it holds the cryptographic keys to actually modify data within those um, enclaves. And now this, um, this entity um, is also then linked to your smartphone um, and has the power to actually load information in there. Um, in the past, we have also seen uh, secure elements um, as part of the SIM card, um, but there, for example, the trusted service manager was um, the mobile network operator, so you had another player in there and this never really took off. Um, and so we have our next try with the smartphone and some entity which is a trusted service manager. Um, there is not just only one service manager, um, but there are a lot of them. And the one who is provisioning your smartphone isn't the one 
that also provisions your, your smart card um, um, in your like, traditional credit card. Um, but those are the two roles which play a major role when it comes to, to making uh, a secure element able to, to make a contactless transaction. So looking at when do we actually get the data into the, the secure element? Um, well, I mean, you want to make a transaction with the secure element, you have, so you have to do it before actually making the transaction. But most likely you already have a card, um, so this happens right before your first transaction. After that, you can make as many transactions as you like. And looking at basically how this, how this works out in the end, um, you as a user, normally enter your credit card number on your smartphone, you scan it, you enter it manually, something like that. And then your smartphone or your app um, talks to the trusted service manager, gets information, hey, I want to provision this kind of card. And this trusted service manager normally has a connection to your issuing bank or a group of issuing banks. And then there it checks, hey, well, I want to add um, this card to my secure element or to this specific phone. Um, can I do this? And normally then the first thing the issuer is doing is talking to you as the owner of your card uh, on a second channel, SMS, email, whatever, and ask you, hey, somebody is asking to provision a new, new card to your smartphone. Is this actually you and do you approve this in the end? And as long as you don't do anything, nothing is happening, so you actually have to confirm this. And then the issuer gets active again and provides to the, to the trusted service manager the information, the cryptographic keys um, that need to be embedded into the secure element. And from there, it goes back to the, um, to the smartphone. And from there on, your smartphone is actually able to just mimic an actual smart card and drive a transaction at a, at a, contact, at a contactless transaction terminal, a contactless cr a credit card terminal. But, well, I mean, in the beginning I talked about cloning um, a card, and we, this is not really true, we saw this. Um, what we do, we rather provision an additional card that is added to the secure element. Um, and this means that the issuer has means to distinguish between, hey, we are now doing a transaction with like an actual card, and we're doing a transaction with a, a phone, which um, has been loaded with the, the information about uh, how to make a card. Also, now we have a smartphone in, in, in play. Uh, we don't have the dumb card. We have something which has logic there. And most of the time also has biometric sensors, other means of, of verif verifying that there's actually the right person using the phone. And what this basically changed or added was an additional verification method, which is called Cold Holder Device CVM or On Device Verification. Um, and those of you who have US used Apple Pay maybe in the past, um, this is when you press um, your home button with your finger and authorize the transaction by this. And this is basically a self-attestation of this device that the right person used um, uh, the, the, uh, the terminal, uh, the, the smartphone for making a transaction. And when we talk about the data that is loaded onto the secure element, um, this is basically the same as if you, it were a, a chip card or a NFC card that was actually handed out by the, your bank. Uh, but most importantly, it, it also includes uh, symmetric and asymmetric keys that are needed for generating the signed data and the cryptogram. And this is really what makes the, um, um, the transaction or adds the same security level as if you would use a, um, a traditional card um, to, the, to the level where you use your smart card for a transaction. And this uses the same verification method in, on the terminal level and also on the bank level to see that this transaction is actually genuine. This is one way to do it, but not everybody um, has a smartphone which has a secure element, which is also trusted by all the issuers. Um, and this is why we have another way of making a smartphone able to act as a, as a card provider. And this is called host card emulation. And um, what we have there is basically we have a smartphone. Could be any smartphone in the end. Well, you need uh, NFC capabilities in there. But other than that, you don't really have many um, requirements there. And then you have your traditional payment network or the issuer which is um, uh, behind that. And um, 
what, what's happening here is that uh, your smartphone no longer receives those generally um, uh, valid crypto, uh, cryptographic keys, but it only gets uh, limited use keys or uh, one-time um, keys basically a code book that can be used for a couple of transactions from the network, but it cannot be used for repeated transactions. Same as with the secure element, you want to make a transaction um, with your newly provided information. So this host card emulation uh, provisioning also needs to happen before actually making the transaction. But in addition to that, or uh, in contrast to the secure element, you only get information that you can use a couple of times. Um, so you need to have a constant network connection in order to make repeated transactions. And if you also look at basically how this look, works out in the end, um, you again enter your credit card information on um, your smartphone, you scan it, whatever. Um, this then directly goes to the payment networks, um, so there is no trusted service manager involved there. Um, and uh, then, depending on the solution you're using, either um, the payment networks themselves generate those one times key that can be used for making a transaction, or this is also forwarded then again to the issuer, to the one who actually gave you your card, um, and they are then uh, generating those uh, um, limited keys, and, and they are then basically handed up again to your, um, to your phone. But the data that you receive isn't really stored in a, in a secure element, it's stored within your application data. So comparing those two methods, HCE versus SE uh, provisioning, um, one of the benefits of HCE is that you don't need a totally secure environment. But if you have it, you can still use it. So you can also put your one-time keys into a secure element, for example. Um, and normally with HCE, you only get limited use crypto keys, um, which are then stored uh, within the app, and which need to be renewed every now and then. And this is also then the catch here. Um, well, what, what happens if your smartphone doesn't have any cell reception and you want to make a couple of transactions? Well, after you have used your a limited number of, of keys to basically create the cryptograms for a transaction, you're out of keys. So at least every once in a while, you need to make network connectivity to refresh the number of keys that, that you have available. And you can also see that uh, HCE is receiving a big push from the industry, so um, actually the, the payment schemes, uh, the payment network um, networks themselves provide SDKs um, for app developers to add this into their applications, um, which abstract away the network communication, which gives predefined interfaces that you can use for, for making the transaction. Um, and which basically is, I mean, if you look at the, from their side, every transaction that is made through one of their networks makes them money, so they want to basically bring more people onto that. And here they actually have an influence. Um, a secure element they cannot modify, but they can bring other app developers uh, to use HCE for their transactions. Well, now we know how we can get data on a terminal um, and act uh, on, a, on a credit card, um, sorry, on a smartphone. And well, now we, we have this data on there and it can simulate now an actual card. But, well, in the end, I don't want to have my credit card data run, uh, lying around in, in some kind of, of application written by some app developer or maybe not even by a bank. I mean, we have seen uh, what this would result in. Um, so there's another thing that was recently introduced, which is account data tokenization. And what this does is basically it replaces your credit card number with a token equivalent. This is basically the same format, same length, again for legacy reasons probably, and this can be used interchangeably with your actual credit card number. And this is something that can then be stored within your app. Well, new features, new players. We have now a token service provider. That's a service which stores mappings between tokens and the actual card number and provides interfaces to adding new ones and to be converting from one to the other. And then you have the token requester, which actually requests um, um, new tokens from, from the service provider um, or uh, ask it to basically translate from one format to the other. 
Luckily, this happens in the same phase as if we would do HHC um, or SE provisioning. So you also want to basically convert your credit card number to a token before you actually do a transaction. And what this then looks like is that you have your, uh, your phone, uh, which knows about your credit card that you want to use. This then goes to the uh, token requester, which for example could be Apple, could be Google. Um, and what they do, they add some information about who you are, maybe your credit history with iTunes or something, or the App Store. And they then talk to a um, token service provider and provide them with the card number and basic information how they know you. And they then talk to the payment networks. And um, from there, it goes into the issuer. And the issuer can say, well, OK, this account is, is existing, is valid. And it's OK to add it as a, as a token, basically. And then this OK on the account goes back to the, to the um, um, tokens, um, uh, uh, to the token provider. And it basically stores the actual number, generates a token, and gives it back um, through the requester to your phone. And then you basically have a phone. Um, which knows about a token, it can discard the credit card number and use this now for every transaction it's, it's doing. Well, why would you want to use tokenization? Well, I mean, yeah, it provides security benefits. So the account number is no longer basically used outside of payment networks. Um, the other benefit is that you can limit the scope on those kind of uh, tokens. So you can say, well, this token that was requested was requested by Apple, so this is only valid for point of sale transactions using NFC. All other kind of transactions through Amazon, through a MaxTrap card, are declined because it's not intended to be used like that. And the other benefit is that um, the tokens can be revoked individually. So for example, if you have two devices and you load your same credit card on both devices, um, they will receive a different token on each device. And that means if one device is compromised, you can basically cancel this token, but the other ones are still working. And your actual credit card number is not compromised because it's not safe there. Think of it of a, an, an app-specific password if you use two-factor author authorization. Um, something that you give one entity, which you can revoke all the time without affecting the others. And the other benefit is that you can use a token not only for um, point-of-sale payments, you can also, for example, use this in an e-commerce context on Amazon, for example. All right, so we know about how can we make a, a phone act as a card. We know how we can make this a little bit more secure. And this is now where we can look at Apple Pay and Android Pay, because they use actually those kinds of information. Making it short, Apple Pay uses the secure element um, on the iPhone that you have and in addition applies account data tokenization. And as a result, you get Apple Pay. And um, if you look at Android Pay, this is rather similar, but they don't have a secure element. We have a fragmented market where you cannot make any assumptions. Um, and this is why they basically are betting on host card emulation. And in addition to that, they are also applying account data tokenization. And in the end, this is Android Pay. If you now look at a transaction, what kind of uh, workflows are happening there? What kind of data is exchanged? Let's assume we already basically went through the initial stage of presenting a card, uh, of presenting your phone, actually. We get rid of the card. Uh, so we presented the phone uh, to the terminal. It read the data. And now we're in this online phase where we actually want to talk to the issuer. Um, instead of having your credit card number, you now have the token. In addition to that, you have the cryptogram that was generated exactly for this transaction, for example, by the secure element. This traditionally goes then to the acquirer. From there, it enters the payment network. And now, one additional step is, is happening. The payment network sees, well, OK, this is a token. This is not a card number. I don't know where to give this to. Um, so first, I have to ask the, the token manager, hey, can you convert this back to a card to me? And so the token gets, goes to the manager, and you get returned um, the actual card number. But this happens within the um, credit card networks, where more or less every information that's flowing around there is visible in plain text anyways. Um, and from there on, the payment network then knows, OK, well, OK, this is a Visa transaction, and this Visa card belongs to, um, for example, my Sparkasse here in, 
uh, Leipzig. And then this data basically is, is uh, given um, to this bank, and the bank can then do the, the normal checking of checking, hey, is this a valid card? In this case, it's a smartphone. Um, is uh, um, the, the cryptogram valid for the transaction? And then gives its okay back. And that's basically what makes uh, a transaction uh, when using HCI, uh, HCE or a secure element, in particular Apple Pay or Android Pay. Um, in this um, scenario, um, Google or uh, Apple would play the role um, um, or would, would play no role in, in, in this because as soon as the data elements are provisioned, um, they are more or less uh, out of the transaction and they also then no longer see the actual card data. So now we have seen, okay, Apple Pay, Android Pay, um, where it adds a different security. Um, what's happening after that? Um, well, first of all, especially in Germany, I want to actually be able to use Apple Pay. Um, I envy my friends in the US, which use this on a daily basis. Um, I'm still sitting here. I can now use Giro Pay, um, but well, this is not helping me. Um, but if you look ar around, there are other things happening. Um, there's something which is called issuer grade um, HCE. Um, the issuers saw that, well, we don't really need a, a token manager in the workflow. I mean, I can actually now give out tokens to, to my customers via my, my own app. Uh, I can also give them the keys that are necessary for that because I'm in the end the one who is verifying them and would be issuing them in the first place. Um, and this also enables um, those uh, issuers to, to give out cards, but cardless just provisioning a, f a card to your actual phone without sending you a physical card. We have also seen alternative payment methods. Um, I mean, traditionally banks are slow to adapt uh, to new technologies. And then there were other players which basically came in. Um, for example, especially in the um, Asia region, we have new ways of making a transaction which removes the card and the terminal altogether, and then we end up with Alipay or WeChat Pay, uh, which just uses a QR code on the phone and an application on the phone of the merchant um, to, to make a transaction. And another thing, well, I mean, legacy for the win. Um, those are big networks. networks this enables you to actually use your card in Germany, in Spain, in Mexico, in the US, in Iceland. Um, this will not change overnight. There are too many um, parties involved and everyone has their own agenda there. So um, probably in the next years, we see alternative payment methods, but we'll always see credit card terminals, credit cards, and smartphones acting as credit cards. And to finish with a personal touch, I work in this area. Um, yes, I know it's a um, it's a very slow progressing area. Um, it uses a lot of legacy code, um, but in the end, this is the best playing field for you to actually improve something, um, to find new um, new areas where you want to improve. Um, and um, this is actually why I got into this. And with that. I want to thank everybody, and thank you. All right, we got enough time for questions. Please line up at the microphones if you are interested in anything. If you want to ask something to Simon. Do we have an internet question? Apparently not. So, oh, <laughs> microphone number three, please. Yeah, thanks for all those insights. That was great. You mentioned that the token requester adds some data, like credit history or something, when they want a token. Could you briefly explain why this is necessary, what this information is used for? Um, well, in the end, this information, uh, well, for, for example, if you talk about Apple Pay, let's use this as a combination. Um, Apple has a, a like a, a history of 
if you're actually a, um, um, a recent user of this card, if you have used it for a long time, how credible you are. Um, and this is just used for making sure that um, a second card is issued to the, to the right person. Um, in the end, this is the most likely attack scenario for Apple Pay, for example, that somebody is using your card and add a second one to his phone and not to your phone. Um, and, and those kind of information um, is just making sure that the right person is actually use or requesting a, a second uh, card on, on their phone. So this is kind of a fingerprint. It's kind not, I, would, I wouldn't say a fingerprint uh, because it's not um, um, reused at a later point. It's just a point uh, um, um, collection of the of your of your of the current moment of what you have been done and how authentic this request seems to be. All right. Uh, for those who are leaving, please a little bit uh, lower down your voice and the noise we still have going on here. So, microphone number one, please. Uh, do I see any difference as a customer uh, if I use a secure element or just host card emulation? So the maximum amount or what happens in case of fraud? Or what happens if the Android phone is rooted? Mm -hmm. So this depends on basically the provider of the HCE, HCE solution. Um, in general, they are on the same level. Um, but um, the one who gives out this one time key could could limit them to a certain amounts. Uh, they normally also limit how many one-time keys you normally get at a, a certain point, so five or ten is normal. Um, and yeah, you're right, if your phone is rooted and somebody else gets access to those, they can be used for actually imposing a, a, a playing imposter and, and making a transaction. Um, but this is limited to like the ones that you receive. This is actually why you limit the number, the number of, of tokens that you get for HCE, uh, because they are not protected as if you would be using a secure element. Then the bank play, blaming me, or is it so? Well, this is an interesting part. Um, I don't know about any case, so um, I don't know. Um, this probably is a case-by-case -case analysis. Okay, let's move on to microphone number six. There's somebody over there. Um, in case uh, multiple cards are w uh, within uh, wireless range, uh, is there uh, collision detection and card enumeration applied, or is it just a general error and uh, nothing happens? Um, so yeah, this is detected. Um, the um, guys who basically invented the contactless specs uh, said, well, okay, if we detect a collision, we say, well, just present one card. So you get an, an error message indicating to you as the one who is providing the cards, hey, please just provide one card and that's it. Probably to make it easier to differentiate which card should actually be used and not adding a new, the, new selection interface to basically prolong the transaction in the end. So I can't present my entire wallet. And you can't, you can, but this will not work. All right, microphone number two, please. Hi. Um, so, uh, if you go back to the uh, secure element provisioning step, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, it would be nice to see that on the screen. Let's have a quick look. Yeah. So, the, the the bottom two lines is that, that that's basically a blob holding the the okay. secret keys, right? Um, so, what um, the Issuer gives back to the um, to the trusted service manager and then to the security is basically a well a standardized blob if you want which holds uh, like the the private crypto keys for the asymmetric and symmetric encryption. Yeah, but those are encrypted, right? Uh, well, kinda yes. So they are encrypted by um, or between the issuer and the uh, service provider, and then from there. To the, to the phone. So um, it's not like you just apply TLS there or something, but it's actually they have shared keys which encrypt this on both sides. So, so only the service provider can do this? Yes. And, and o only, only the service provider has the knowledge about how um, the secure element can be provisioned and the keys for actually changing data in there. Yeah, yeah. so and who is that? So in, in case of Apple Pay, uh, this is Apple. 
And in any other case? It, well, I don't know about any other solution which uses a secure, secure element to make a, uh, a contactless transaction work. Um, and, well, in the HC case, we don't have this entity. But okay. it could be, for example, if you talk about a traditional credit card, um, then this could be, for example, Obertur or Gemalto, basically the, the creators of the, or the, the manufacturers of the actual cards that you get sent by the, by the bank. And, and the keys of those uh, secure elements are diversified? Yes, so there's not one provider who has every key, but basically there are a couple of entities which then um, have their own access to their cards, basically. Yeah, so wh okay, what I mean uh, is you can... Let's you can go on to the next question. I mean, this is a dialogue. I'm sorry, that's a little bit too much. We have an internet question, please. Just drop by laughter. The uh, internet wants to know, uh, are tokens static on a device or are they ever updated and would there be an advantage to changing them? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the one-time keys that are... Um, Oh, no, so, sorry, we're talking about the tokens. Um, so the token, once it's basically provisioned, they are normally static um, until you basically say, well, I want to add another card. Even if it's the same card, you will probably get a, a different token. But in general, it's basically static. Um, yes, there would be a benefit in changes regularly, just removing um, fingerprinting options there. Um, but uh, as I think the, the, the major benefit of actually having this kind of, of uh, option is um, that you can hide your actual credit card number. And this, I think, was a, the primary focus on there. Okay, microphone number four, please. You were talking about uh, payment networks like MasterCard and Visa. Is the same technology used for contactless payment cards known as a Giro card in Germany? Or is this completely different? Mm, it's similar. I mean, the Giro card has its own kernel, which uh, should be running on the terminal. Um, and you don't have this those global payment network, if you will, but you have like a, a local German network um, which is connected to different service providers. Um, but the handling overall is, is more or less similar, yeah. And microphone number five, please. Hi. Um, hey. I heard or I often hear that risk management is one of the most important things for credit card institutes or a pretty important thing. Do you have any experience in this or do you know if there really is so much money stolen from the credit card institutes or during the transaction? Um, well, I think you have to differentiate. I mean, there are um, credit card uh, issuers or companies who have been doing this in a long time, and especially in Europe, they are very keen on checking the data as part of the risk management. Um, when EMV was introduced in the US, there were instances where the bank introduced EMV, but they didn't check any data, so you could just send in transaction, they would be approved. Um, um, so yes, uh, this happens from time to time, um, but if the correct checking is implemented, then um, this is uh, very hard. Okay, let's get back to microphone number three. Hello. Uh, I think you forgot to mention another uh, alternative. You can pay with the phone or nearly pay with the phone because some banks are also issuing near the card the near field communication sticker mm -hmm. that you can just put on the back of the phone and mm -hmm. it works even when you don't have the signal. Isn't that the easiest way? Well, this works. Um, and yes, you're right. This is also one of the options that you can use. In that case, you don't, doesn't even necessarily need a, a phone. You can stick this to anything. Um, and true, this is like a key fob or something that you carry around with you. Um, this also works. This has been tried in Germany, for example. Um, the network operators, um, T-Mobile and so on, uh, have tried this, but it didn't reach critical mass and never took off, and then they buried it. I guess this is now the next try of, of getting it to the masses. In my country, in Slovenia, that's uh, released by the bank, and okay. you can pay with it. Well, this is just an alternative then to the to actual credit card, yes. Okay, number one microphone, please. Okay, so when I got uh, my uh, one of the last uh, cards a couple of years ago, uh, before the first time that I could pay contactless, I had to pay with a contact. I had to instruct the card. Is there a technical reason for that? Um, in general, no. Um, I think this is just uh, checking that everything is okay and that uh, the account is still available. Um, um, Otherwise, you could, for example, use this card for below uh, contactless limits um, without needing any PIN or anything else. Uh, I think this is just a, a first risk check, um, but there is no technical reason for it. Okay, and microphone number six, please. When using host card emulation, how do the limited use 
keys get updated? Does that require card auto interaction? Does it happen automatically? So this normally happens behind the scenes. So you, as a user of the smartphone, don't see this. Um, this happens basically asynchronously in the background. Um, and whenever the phone sees well, or the application sees well, I'm running out of keys, um, it refreshes them. Let's go to microphone two, please. Uh, ah, uh, hi. Um, could you elaborate a bit on why the banks are pushing uh, more for host card emulation than SE. I understand why Google uses host card emulation, but the banks are a pretty powerful entity and could basically put their weight behind forcing manufacturers to use SEs. Why don't they? So, from what I understand, yes, they couldn't put more force on that, but in the end, you also need manufacturers who want to support it. And if you're looking, for example, at, at Android, it's pretty fragmented. There might be one manufacturer who adds a secret element to their phone, but, well, first of all, you need to basically be able to cater then for markets and sell it in markets. Um, so, me here in Germany, it doesn't help me if uh, a Chinese maker is adding this to his smartphone. And I'm also not so sure how, uh, how, how much I would trust this implementation. So, a secure element is basically, um, has the same capabilities of a card. Um, so, you really need uh, a trusted entity in there. And this is, I think, why the, why the issuers basically focus more on host card emulation because they can actually influence it. They don't have any external requirements of uh, some, some manufacturer adding some stuff there. Um, for example, with Android, they just need a recent handset with, I think, Android 4 Plus, um, and then they are more or less good to go. Thanks. All right. Uh, any questions from the internet? Nope. Okay. Nope. Let's go on to microphone number four, please. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I wonder if there are any liability changes uh, when uh, these uh, new workflows with uh, mobile payments uh, arrived, like secure element and host card emulation. Who is liable for the fraud in these cases? Because there are now new players, mm -hmm. for example, uh, the trusted service providers, which basically owns the secure, uh, the crypto keys for the emulated card. But overall, this doesn't change anything. It's the same as if you would use your credit card. Um, yes, there's somebody who basically can put data in your secure element, but uh, those types of entities have been existing in the past, the ones who basically provisioned your own actual physical card, um, and they undergo the same um, certifications, or I don't know what, how you want to call this, like the same requirements in order to become one um, when it comes to securing your data. Um, so in the end, um, the same liability is there. Um, and as long as you use EMV, um, you are protected by it, except for if you use a PIN or something, what, whatever with the banks come up with in the end. Yeah. But in general, if you use EMV, the liability is with the, with the, the bank. Second small question, is there such a thing as an offline uh, contactless payments? And if there is, uh, how widespread are they? Technically, yes, you can use it. Um, but this then really shifts the liability, because um, um, then you are uh, um, ignoring the result of the transaction and basically just trying to accept it. Um, but you have to differentiate between saying, well, I want to use, uh, I want to work in a, in a strictly offline environment and um, I have an offline approved transaction, um, which could also happen. But uh, nowadays, um, I think in almost all countries that uh, I've been working with, um, there is this, this floor limit, which indicates to the terminal, when should I go online for a transaction? And this is at zero. So normally every transaction is authorized online. Thank you. Okay, and microphone number five, please. I think there is somebody over there. Hi. Um, how does PIN verification work and how is it different compared to a chip transaction? So when looking at a chip transaction, you normally have three ways of verifying a PIN. So you can basically check this offline, so just between the terminal and the card, and there you have two ways of encrypting it or doing it in plain text. So this is how the terminal communicates with the card and actually wants the, the PIN to be verified. And then there's a, second, a third option, which is online PIN, 
where the PIN that you enter is actually encrypted on the terminal and then together with your authorization sent to the bank and the bank checks that the PIN is actually valid. And when we're talking about off, uh, off, uh, contactless transactions, then only the third option is actually available. So if you use a PIN for contactless transaction, this always goes to the, to the issuer for, for checking um, because there is no card anymore for verifying the PIN offline. And microphone number three, please. My question would be about uh, Apple Pay in Germany. Um, banks in Germany seem to be reluctant to accept it and implement it. Um, so one reason seems to be that they have to give up a little share of their, their, the, the fee transaction, uh, the tra uh, transaction fee they, mm -hmm. they receive. Um, so my question would be, um, how, does Apple, how does Apple know about the transaction and which data is sent to, to Apple when I pay with, uh, with the phone? Mm -hmm. So um, I don't want them to be involved too much. <laughs> yes, and, and in the end, they actually aren't. Um, well, in order to basically be able to use Apple Pay on your phone, your issuer needs to participate in this charade um, of provisioning a card. And this also then means that they enter an agreement that a percentage of every transaction is basically paid out to Apple. Um, and this happens basically independently of making the transaction. So the, 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 the issuers are aggregating basically the transactions and then basically providing Apple with information of how much they get. There is no direct feedback as, of, as uh, part of every transaction to Apple that, wait, well, I made a transaction about this and this means that you get that. So this is like a trusting a contractual agreement between the issuer and, the, and Apple. In microphone number one, please. I also worry about transaction privacy and is mm -hmm. this any different uh, with Android Pay? Do they get any d uh, transaction data? Um, so this is kind of similar. Um, also there, um, in general, Apple, uh, Google doesn't get any transaction data. Um, they have access to the same elements that you have as part of a transaction. Um, but after you apply the, the tokenization, you also just have your replaced account number. Um, in theory, they could do more. Um, to be honest, I don't know 100% what they actually store and what is basically um, transferred as part of a transaction. But I would assume that this is similar to what Apple does because this is a highly sensitive uh, topic and if there's any wrongdoing there, then this would create a real sh shitstorm, yeah. Okay, we're good in time. There's one more question left, as it looks like. Please, microphone four. Hello, thanks for the great talk. But I think you missed something. Okay. Yeah, and maybe I missed it, but you never mentioned number 26 with this QR code paying. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that's basically similar to the alternative payment methods which basically come up. Um, and this is a way where you no longer need a card, actually. You just need your smartphone to display a QR code. And this is then scanned at the, at the cashier system. And um, this basically includes information of, of making the transaction. Yeah? Um, yes, you're right. This is a, a valid way of doing this, for example, in Germany. Um, but um, I wanted to focus on actually making like a cloning or making card payments with, with your smartphone so what, um, as a replacement for a, for a normal credit card. So this is why I didn't focus on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Simon. Um, apologies again for the small delay. Thanks a lot, yeah.